Good early morning to everyone. I am very impressed that you managed to brave the climate and, uh, and the, um, uh, the security in this building and join us um, to welcome someone back who is a wonderful friend of the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO, uh, a recovering politician and someone who cares very deeply about the work that Saab Arakat is doing. Uh, as most of you know, our scholars closely track the ever-shifting tectonic plates of the Middle East. Nearly half of our uh, signature ground truth briefings, which many of you listen into, featuring experts in hotspots around the globe, commenting on breaking news as it unfolds, have focused on Egypt, Iran, Syria, and the peace process. Our Middle East program, led by the fearless Hali Esfandiari, our Iranian inmate, uh, has held 63 events uh, in this last year alone, and that program, too, is keenly interested in this latest Washington leg of the peace process. Two weeks ago, on the sidelines of Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu's visit, we hosted Israel's Minister of Justice and Chief Negotiator for the peace process, Zippy Livni, and we also hosted here uh, at the center the Minister of Intelligence, Yuval Steinitz. Uh, as a member of the U.S. Congress over 17 years, I traveled more than 25 times to the region, and I continue to visit. And I've just invited myself to Saab's home next year, uh, along with my large family. Um, I was in Gaza in 1998 uh, when the PLO removed the provision of its charter uh, calling for the elimination of Israel. Saab was there, too, and Dennis Ross, who was just a few feet away from me, uh, was crying. We all thought that peace was at hand. Uh, but since then, there have been countless missed opportunities. I strongly believe, this is my personal view, that without a two-state solution, both sides lose. Israel forfeits her legitimacy as a Jewish democracy, uh, especially once the youth bulge in the Palestinian population within its borders becomes a majority, and Palestinians, who have been pawns in a local and regional power game for too long, miss out on prosperity. The Arab Peace Initiative has been on the table since 2002 and is what Saab has called one of the greatest missed opportunities so far. Uh, one of the people in, in a small, on a small list of the most important people keeping the dream of a two-state solution afloat is our friend and the Palestinian Authority's lead negotiator, Saab Arakat. This is his, as I mentioned, second visit to the Wilson Center and his only, thank you, Saab, major public address on the sidelines of President Abbas's visit to Washington. Saab was born in 1955 and still lives in the same house in Jericho. In true Wilsonian fashion, he is the consummate scholar and policymaker. He began his career as a professor of political science at the An Najah National University. And as Aaron David Miller, whom you'll hear from in just a moment, uh, has said of his friend of 25 years, Saab has, quote, seen it all and remains a champion of the Palestinian national narrative, unquote. From Madrid and Oslo to Camp David, Annapolis, and the Kerry process, it's a good name for it, um, he has remained a constant. But the last time he was here, he said, quote, my CV is one line negotiating with the Israelis. I was not born to be a mercenary for territories. Well, uh, we agree, and we hope to add another line soon or to replace that with another line soon, with another word soon, and that word is peacemaker. Uh, Saab uh, has decided not to make uh, some opening remarks. Instead, he just wants to start a conversation with Aaron and following that, we will take your questions. Um, I also want to recognize the League of Arab States Ambassador to the U.S., Mohammed Al Husseini Al Sharif, who is here somewhere, who is not here. Yes, he is. There he is. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. And uh, now, let me turn the program over to two very special people: Aaron Miller and our dear, dear friend Saab Arakat. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank <clears throat> you very much, um, and for your extraordinary leadership of this center. And thank you all for coming at such an early hour. Saab, I have four questions for you. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to begin with just one personal observation. We've known each other for a very long time, since the early 80s. 
before Madrid, through the Oslo process, through Camp David in July of 2000, through the collapse of Camp David, through the darkest years of Israeli-Palestinian confrontation, through the Annapolis process, right up to the present. We've had our arguments, disagreements, we've yelled at each other, we've celebrated with, one, with each other, we've actually shed a few tears with one another as well. Throughout it all, I just want you to know that you have maintained a relentless belief in one primary uh, conviction, uh, and, and I agree with it as well, and it is the notion that only through negotiations, as imperfect and as flawed as this process is, can the Israeli-Palestinian conflict be resolved. And negotiations are not perfect. They're based on human weakness and frailty. They're based on the, the need to make extraordinary decisions that depart and force people to give up dreams and aspirations. And they're imperfect. As I get older, I realize um, uh, the peace process, too, like old age, is a very imperfect thing, but it sure beats the alternative. And my real concern, frankly, um, and my own analysis has been quite sober on these matters for years now. My real concern is if the idea that talking and negotiating cannot resolve that, this conflict, if that dies, then the alternative truly is uh, one that will bring catastrophe for all of us. And you've, you've, your willfulness, your stubbornness at times, your conviction has made you a formidable interlocutor in these negotiations, representative of the Palestinian narrative, but with a capacity to understand the needs of the, of the other of the Israelis. So I want to welcome you again, Saab Erekat, to the Wilson Center. I have four questions for you, and I'll start with the obvious. What can you tell us about uh, President <coughs> Abbas's meeting with Barack Obama yesterday? Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jen. I Look forward to seeing you in Jericho. I have six grandchildren now. And <laughs> I think the meeting was, uh, use the term, candid. Uh, the meeting was uh, difficult, and the meeting was long. And. Uh, as contrary to what people expected that we'll come out of this meeting with an official American proposal document, this did not happen. We're still at the stage of discussing uh, ideas. But uh, I think no one, no one benefits more from the success of Obama and Kerry than Palestinians, and no one stands to lose more of failure than Palestinians. We want to do it. We really want to do it. I'm, I'm, I did not wake up one morning and felt my conscience aching for anyone. <laughs> I'm doing this, Jane, for me. I'm not doing this really a favor. It's time for Palestinians to have a state of their own. It's time for Palestinians to stop. You know, in 2014, this year, January, 27 Palestinians died of starvation in Yarmouk refugee camps in Damascus. This happens in 2014. And it's really becoming to be so difficult to be a Palestinian. So we really want Obama and Kerry to succeed. Their success means my freedom, my independence, my statehood, means that Palestinians will have a home to come to. And we hope that these nine months we have till April 29th will bring with it the solution, and, and, and it's doable, and it can be done. It can be done. What, what's the expectation? You, you mentioned the fact that, you, that there was a sense that maybe out of the meeting would, would come a piece of paper or, or a formal document. What, what is the expectation on your side with respect to what the Americans ultimately will put on the table? <clears throat> I hope that the Americans will put on the table something that's fair. And I hope that the Americans, you know from better than anybody else, I discussed this with you as an American diplomat, an American peacemaker. 
at the day the Americans will depart from the squares of what's possible to the square of what's needed, we make a deal. What's possible, American diplomacy, is what the Israeli Prime Minister can do and what the Israeli pr Prime Minister cannot do. And then once they design this, they come to us trying to convince us of their ideas. You know the story. I hope that the Americans today will move in the direction of what's needed. What's needed, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's really two states, 1967. We have recognized the state of Israel right to exist in peace and security on the 1967 borders. I hope and pray that the Prime Minister of Israel will stand tall and say, I recognize the state of Palestine right to exist on the 1967 line so Palestine and Israel can live in peace and security. You know, the, the irony, Aaron, Aaron, is that when we began the negotiations, July 29th, till today, I think it's been now seven and a half months, 10,589 housing settlements units in the supposed to be Palestinian state, four times the natural growth of New York. I cannot weigh two kilos in Jericho and weigh 100 kilos in Washington. I really cannot. You know, you make peace, you make delivery, you need to have your constituency believe that you can do it. And what is this behavior? Why, why the dictation? Why the settlement activities? Why the demolition of homes? Why? I, you know, look, I agree with you. I agree with you that the, the most important thing for Palestinians and Israelis to realize that negotiating in peace and frustration for five years it's cheaper than exchanging bullets for five minutes. So talk, I mean, when, when people say that uh, we cannot solve our problem by talking, it's over. It's a disaster. It's a nightmare. And you don't want to do this. You, Palestinians and Israelis don't want to do this. And what is it? It's going to be two states on 1967. I know since Eve negotiated Adam, I'm the most disadvantaged negotiator in history. Have no army, no navy, no air force. My people are fragmented. If it's my word against any Israeli in the Congress and the Senate, I don't stand a chance. And who said life is about fairness and justice? I'm out there to make peace. I'm out there, I have recognized the state of Israel right to exist. And up till today, the 18th of March, 2014, I haven't heard any Israeli from this government saying, I'm going to recognize the state of Palestine, right to live in peace and security. It's just designing the blame game, blaming me, showing my bad intention, analyzing this, analyzing that, smearing me. And, and this, what, is, what does it do? Does it save lives of Israelis and Palestinians? It's really time for decisions. Do the Israelis see us as their neighbors? Do they want to live and let live? Do they want to have two-state solution? I cannot stand guards on their lips, and I could care less if someone is pro-Palestinian or someone pro-Israeli. My world is divided between those who are pro-peace and those who are against peace. And those who are pro-peace are those who want the two-state solution. Those who want to save lives of Israelis and Palestinians. So I hope that this American administration, and look, there's a difference now. Kerry is different. I was going to ask you about that. Ask me. <laughs> You've dealt with uh, at least three U.S. presidents and uh, at least a half a dozen, seven actually, uh, secretaries of state. Um, it's time to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was a lot taller before I started. <coughs> um, how is Kerry different? I've known John Kerry for 26 years. Uh, number one, he knows me inside out. I can't, I can't play games with him. He knows Israelis inside out. He is a man who is really a believer in the two-state solution. And he has no doubts whatsoever that it can be done. Thirdly, you know, um, the difference today is that, you know, Syria and Libya, Iran, Yemen, Egypt, the Middle East is changing. It's different than the Middle East you were seeing me in a few years ago. And yet, Mr. Kerry believes that the key to stability, democracy in this region is a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. 
he does realize that it begins there. He believes that, you know, this, this region needs, number one, peace between Palestinians and Israelis. And here, you don't, eat, you don't need to eat the apple from the start. John Kerry knows it's going to be two states, 1967, mutually agreed swaps, so on, so on, so on. And all issues are doable. And he knows that the second element that this region needs is democracy in the Arab world. And anyone who says Arabs are not ready for democracy is a racist. So this is the combination of delivering the Middle East towards stability, human rights, accountability, transparency, democracy, and the rule of law. And he's a firm believer on this. All right, one more question on the Americans, and then one on the Israelis and Palestinians, and we'll go to the audience's questions. Um, you know as well as I that the traditional, and I say this with the ultimate detachment and objectivity, the American MO in negotiations, uh, at least since the first Bush administration, has essentially been to operate in the arena of the possible, not in the arena of what is required. Our traditional method of operating has been to take Israeli ideas, alter and change them, <coughs> and, try to, and try to market them to Palestinians. And I say this... Make them I'm, your own. You mean. I'm just reporting <laughs> here. I, it's not a moral judgment. It's simply an accurate assessment of the way American peace teams have operated. There may be legitimate reasons for all of this, but it is a, a fair description. So it was your, it's your point of departure, and I'd like you to just comment on it for a minute. Is this administration operating still in the area of the possible rather than on the, in the area of what is actually required to reach an agreement? And if so, how do you reconcile that with <coughs> your praise for the secretary? Because at least with President Obama and with Secretary Kerry, I'm allowed to speak about what's possible and versus what's required. This is on the table. This is, we discuss about it. Right. And, uh, and the second point is, I don't believe that the U.S. borders are with Canada and Mexico and the two oceans today. Your role has shifted. You have presence in many areas in the Middle East. Your borders sometimes are with Iran, Turkey, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, China, Pakistan, the Gulf, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. And when the political geography of superpowers change, the functional role of nations change, and what do you want to do? I mean, the, the, the possible did not get us anywhere. Did not get us anywhere. Because I told you my situation, and I know that Israel has 3,000 tanks, 2,000 fighting planes, and nuclear weapons, but also they have three options. Number one is my option. Two states on 1967, live and let live. Number two, if honestly, if, if the Israelis, some of them believe that they want to call my hometown Jericho Yericho, and refer, that's the Hebrew name for Jericho, if they want to refer to Nablus as Shechem, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, refer to me as Mar Erekat instead of Mr. Erekat, I tell them, talk to me about it. I'm not a racist. Once I say this, oh, you evil Palestinians, you want to undermine the Jewish nature of Israel. I'm recognizing you in 1967. Accepting to establish my state in the remaining 22% of the land, accepted swaps, accepted many, many things that I cannot elaborate now. And you're still building settlements next to my bedroom in Jericho, in Ramallah, in Hebron, all over. And when I say what your actions on the ground, there is no such a thing as one state solution. There is a one state reality being created by the dictations on the ground. It cannot be. So it's, people are wrong when they say one-state solution. There can never be a one-state solution. Israel will never accept a one-state solution. But what they're doing is creating a one-state reality. Number three, and that's an eye-opener for those, and people must listen to what I say. Number three is that there are roads in the West Bank and East Jerusalem today I cannot use as a Palestinian. Only Israelis can use. And Aaron. Such diseases as bigotry and racism, once they inflict un underneath our skins, throughout history, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, whites, blacks, Jews can be racist. Some people justified, you know, this apartheid or bigotry 
with the sociologic, sociological tools, economical tools, psychological tools, sexual tools, and now it's being explained by the term security. This is, it's, it's not good for any society, it's for the, their own society. These are Israel's three options. What do they want to do with me? I ask all of them to walk me through my hometown, Jericho, to the military, to the Tel Aviv in the Mediterranean. What do they see in the year 2019? What do they see? Why do they feel that they always have to negotiate between themselves what BB can do with Livni, Livni with Bennett, Bennett with Steinitz, Steinitz with Yalon, and then once they finish negotiations, come here, boy, we know what's best for you, and if you don't want to do that, then you are, you know, start a smear campaign and the blame game and so on, like what they did to me in Camp David, and you know what they did to me in Camp David. So, I believe that this American administration showing some genuine move towards what's needed, but I will not be able to answer the question mm. without seeing the product that they're going to put on the table. Right. Two more questions, and we'll go to the audience. Uh, one concerns Israel, and one that concerns Palestinians. Um, the history of peacemaking on the Israeli side is a history of transformed hawks. It's not a history of the left or liberals or even the center left. It's Begin, it's Rabin, the breaker of bones in the first intifada. It's Sharon disengaging from Gaza. Is the current prime minister of Israel a potentially transformed hawk? Is he, in your judgment, willing and able to make the kinds of choices necessary, forget concluding a peace agreement, but at least advancing this process to its next phase? I saw him. A year ago, something, a letter from Abu Mazen, my president, to him. And he goes to me like this, Aaron. Saeb, I've known you for 30 years. Stop smearing me. I'm going to do it. So I tell him, repeat after me. Two states, ahat tesha sheva. That's the Hebrew for one, nine, six, seven. He couldn't say it. He couldn't utter these numbers. I haven't heard him. I haven't heard him. I don't know if anyone, Jane or anyone, have heard him saying that I accept two states on 1967. Bring him someone to have him utter these four, four numbers. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was here in Washington when he was speaking to the conference of ABAC, and then I see him saying that Beit El and Hebron are going to be part of Israel. What's that? He has to make up his mind. He really has to make up his mind. Look, I'm not going to get into the blame game here. I'm not going to do anything. I know that Israelis and Palestinians are going through transformation. I know that our labor pains have taken us so much. I'm, I'm not comparing this conflict with any other conflict on earth. This conflict is about history, religion, faith, and, and you know, we did not waste a minute in the 20 years, honestly. It's, it's a transformation that's difficult on me and difficult on them. But at the end of the day, it's time for decisions today, not negotiations. It's time for Palestinian president to stand tall and say, I recognize Israel's right to exist on 67. I want to live with a two-state solution. Yes, I do this, this, and that. And then it's time for the Israeli prime minister to start preparing his people for what it takes to make peace, to say, I recognize the state of Palestine, right to exist on the 1967 lines. He has not done this. None of them have done this. And I really urge them, if they hear me today, to stand tall and address their neighbors. You know, we brought 300 Israeli students three weeks ago to Abu Mazen and Ramallah. Speak to them, prepare them, Israelis. And then last week we brought him 300 Palestinian students. Speak to him, what you accepted, two states, 1967, agreed swaps, this, and every caveat, everything is doable. Every day I wake up and hope that Netanyahu will bring 300 Israeli students or 300 Palestinians st to say, yes, I'm on board. I want to make the two-state solution on 1967. He didn't do that. So. Okay, final question. I asked this question to you last time you, you were here. I'll ask it again. Israelis and Palestinians have become masters. No, you said, you asked me about Palestinians. You asked about Israelis and now? Palestinians. Yeah. Yeah. Israelis and Palestinians have become masters of the blame game. Oh, yes. 
So my question to you is, I'll borrow a line from one of Michael Jackson's better songs, Man in the Mirror, and he said, and I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> I won't sing it. Yeah, look in the mirror. Uh, huh? He said, you want to make a change in your life? You really want to make a change? Then the place to start is by looking in the mirror. Now, I believe that, so mm -hmm. I really do believe it. I mean, we've all taken long looks. Uh, what we've done right, what we've done wrong. So if I were to ask you, if you were to look in the mirror as a Palestinian, how would you critique your own approach to these negotiations? What, what responsibility, and I know you're the weakest party to the negotiation of people under occupation. And there's an asymmetry of power, I know all this. I'm not a Palestinian, I don't feel it the way you do, you live it. But if you could detach yourself for a moment, what is it that you would have changed? Have Palestinians made no mistakes during the course of these negotiations? I think it will take me, if I'm going to you know, count Palestinian mistakes, it's going to be a long, long list of things. <laughs> Look, Aaron, we, we are a very young authority, very young on this. We're less than 20 years old. I'm crawling. I'm really crawling. And when mistakes happen, it's not that I wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to decide to make these mistakes, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I'm doing it because I don't know otherwise. You're a nation of 250 years or so, more, and you make mistakes. There are a nation of 2,000 years, and they make mistakes. My situation, I'm called Palestinian Authority. I'm in the process of an institution building. I cannot leave my hometown, Jericho to Ramallah, without the permission of the Israeli commander. If my president, Mahmoud Abbas, wants to go to Amman, he has to seek permission of Israelis. I have an overloaded wagon of complexities in every common sense of the transformation I'm going through. And so mistakes can be my last time <laughs> in this situation. I'm not excusing myself, but are we learning from our mistake? Yes, we are. Are we admitting that we're making mistakes? We are making mistakes. Look, we woke up one morning and we thought that we were perfect and then we were not perfect. We're just like you and the Israelis and the Norwegians and the Nigerians and the and, uh, Argentinians. We're normal people. We have good people, we have bad people, we have honest, we have liars, we have thieves, we have drug traffickers. We turn out to be not perfect. So stop looking at me and expecting me to be perfect. Because that's the irony of things, that Israelis and Americans, when they speak to me, they have the expectation, you're perfect. Why do you do this? Why did this, Miam said this in this mosque? Why did, <laughs> I'm not perfect. But we have come a long way. And we're coming a long way. And I know Palestine will come back to the map. Palestine, we will not compromise. Palestine, with democracy, human rights, accountability, transparency, the rule of law, women's rights, and that's what Palestine will be about. Mistakes will be committed. People will misuse their offices. That will not stop. But I can assure you, Aaron, that we're not going to hide it. You're going to hear about it in Palestine TV. Thank you, Saab Arakant. Uh, you've been very patient. Questions? I think I, I see Jane Harmon's hand up. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to say that as a mother of four, I know that perfection is not an option for my children. However, my grandchildren are perfect. Um, Saab. Uh, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And yours are too. Um, wonderful conversation. But nobody mentioned um, a, a word uh, that is Hamas. Uh, most people or many people here are for a two-state solution, but not for a three-state solution. Right. Uh, what are the plans to reconcile whatever the right word is to annex, that's a Russian word for today, uh, or some other way to make uh, Hamas a part of the uh, Palestinian <laughs> side in this negotiation? Hamas is a Palestinian political party, Jen. Hamas defeated my party in the year 2006. And I know that it's my obligation that a Palestinian state composed of the West Bank and Gaza Strip with East Jerusalem's capital must be a state with one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. This is on me, all right? Now, we are 
exerting every possible effort in order to reconcile, to have the reconciliation. And there is only one way to do this. When we differ, when political parties differ anywhere on earth in democracies, they resort to ballot boxes, not to bullet boxes. Hamas must understand this. When we differ, we resort to ballots and not bullets. Hamas strategic mistakes, they resorted to bullets. It was a dark day in our history when Hamas made this coup d'etat in Gaza. Now, we're offering Hamas to go back to presidential, legislative, PNC elections. And Hamas must understand that we have an obligation, one authority, one gun, the rule of law, and we have obligations as far as two-state solution, renouncing violence, and so on. And we're, 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 uh, we're moving. I'm not saying it's done. We're moving. I remember I was elected in 2006 to my party, Fatah, to represent, uh, to be the representative in the Legislative Council. And my luck again, in 40, first time in 40 years, we are the minority as Fatah movement. So I was asked to respond to Mr. Haniya's submission of his government to a vote of confidence in the, I was the loyal opposition. So I remember that day I told him, said, Mr. Haniya, today you are not the prime minister of Hamas. You are my prime minister. You are the Palestinian people prime minister. Please act as such, separate between your role as Hamas and your role as prime minister. When, when Khomeini came to office in, in Iran, he changed the name of his country. But yet his first statement was he committed to all obligations of his country. So did Nelson Mandela. So do governments who came out throughout history in democracies, theocracies, autocracies, coups. And then, you know, I, I was really sincere in, in, in telling him you are, you are the prime minister of all Palestinians. Separate between your role as Hamas leader and as the prime minister of the Palestinians. He chose to tell me, since we won the elections, the UN must change its charter. Since we won the elections, uh, PLO must cancel agreement with Israel. So I had to, to respond to him that day. Sir, democracy worked, Hamas failed. I hope that Hamas will accept our logic that when we differ, we go back to the people in, in, in presidential legislative elections. And this is the only way to have Palestinian reconciliation. Barbara Slavin. Hi, Saab. I've it's only, known, you, you, only known you 23 years. It's nothing. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. Um, you, you know me when I was 13 years old. Yeah, I know. <laughs> when we both had dark yes. hair. Um, Saab, explain to us what the big deal is about calling Israel the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me if that's the only price you still have to pay to get your state, that it's not such a big price and that it's implicit in all the things that the PLO and the Palestinians have accepted over the years. Thanks. Okay, Barbara. I <clears throat> so now we have the question about Hamas, we have the question about Bibi, about Kerry, and now the Jewish state business. Number one, I don't sit with Israelis and decide with them and how they define themselves. Usually nation states have their own committees that put their basic laws, constitutions, and define themselves in any way they want. But I promise you, Barbara, I will never interfere in Israel's basic law, constitution, or anything. That's for them to do. That's number one. Number two, I agreed with the Israelis that we have a, a range of issues that we box for negotiations. And we defined issues like Jerusalem, border settlements, refugees, security, relations with neighbors. And no one can bring new items in the agenda of the negotiations. Three years ago, Madame Livni actually came and decided to introduce, you must recognize us as a Jewish state. Why? Why should I recognize you as a Jewish state? You're, as individuals, we have birth certificate. When I was born, my mom went, or dad went to the Ministry of Health in Palestine or in Jordan and whatever, and they registered my name in a birth certificate. When nations are born, they also have a birth certificate they register at the UN. Israel's name is State of Israel. That's what they call themselves, State of Israel. I have recognized the State of Israel right to exist, exchange letters of recognition, September 13th, 1993. 
Now let me be very frank with you and very honest with you. I recognize that I cannot stand guards on Israel's lips. I cannot, or their way of thinking. But Israelis cannot deny the fact that I have my own narrative. I have my religion. I have my story. I'm not asking them to believe in this. I'm not asking them to say that we must stand up and we believe the Palestinian narrative. I come from Jericho. This town was built by the Natofians 10,000 years ago. The Canaanites were there thousands of years before Yeshua bin Nun came and burned my hometown, Jericho. All right? This is my narrative. I'm not asking them, I don't ask them, come and sign that you accept this narrative and that the wall of my hometown became a crumb building, whatever you want. This is my, I believe this. I believe this story. Don't ask me to change my narrative. When they ask me to do, to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, what they're doing is they're asking me to change my narrative. Why, why, I mean, now it's, it's, it's Jewish land, and then I, be, I was the intruder on this land. It's not the case, it's not my story. But am I gonna interfere in how Israel defines itself in its books, and its laws, and constitutions, and so on? And then, I don't know if there are any Israelis in this room. Dan, you have a passport with you? What does it say on it, nationality? I don't think it says Jews, or Christians, or Druze, or Muslims. I think it says Israelis. Right? The passport that Prime Minister Netanyahu travels in defines their nationality as Israeli. So now you want me to, that you have a passport saying Israeli, and you want me to come and say that Jewish, or Druze, or Christian, or Muslim, and so on? Oh, come on. I, it's really. But you know, sometimes some people sit in Israel. How do we, what does Saab Arakat, what can, what can we create today that he will, not, will have to say no to, so we can smear him? <laughs> you know, so, so what, what do we do today so we can put them in the corner and put their back on the wall and to have them, that's what they do to me. The second story, they come to me and tell me, oh, uh, Jordan Valley, my constituency. Israel security, threats coming from the east. We must stay there for, I don't know how many, how many years. I for God's sakes, you have a border with Jordan, south and north of Jericho. That's 510 kilometers. And if the threat will come from the east, it will come from your border with Jordan or the north or south, not from my hometown, Jericho. And why, why, why is it that I'm always, you know, whenever you mention Palestinians, it must insinuate threats. Let us confine ourselves to what we agreed to discuss and negotiate and reach an agreement with, and that's what we should do. And then Israel can define itself in its textbooks, in its laws and constitutions, whatever they want to say, I'm not going to interfere in that. Uh, Hala, did you have a question? Yes. Hala Svendiari. Thank you. Quick uh, question, taking you back to Hamas and Gaza. What do they understand under a two-state solution, or are they 100% against the two-state solution? I'm, I'm not a Hamas spokesperson, but I know that in, uh, they formed two governments, one by their own when they won the elections, and one with us, National Unity. In both programs, there was a provision in the program saying that the political negotiations is under the jurisdiction of the PLO. And once an agreement is reached, it must be put to a national public referendum. And you know what? I accept that. I accept that. I accept that. They say, they say we accept a state on 1967. They don't say we recognize Israel. So they have their own vocabulary, their own uh, terminology, and they doing it. But as I told you, I am under obligation when a state of Palestine is born, it's a state that in the Gaza and the West Bank is one authority, one gun, the rule of law. This is my obligation. And uh, I believe once an agreement is reached, uh, uh, Hamas demand to put it to a national public referendum is a fair demand, and we're going to do that. And we're going to do that. And I think it will pass. It will pass with a huge majority. Yes. Uh, and Said. Uh, please identify yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Saeed Erekat. I'm a Palestinian journalist in town. Uh, 
you know, at the pace that you cited for the settlement activity, I think Congresswoman Harmon should visit you very soon, lest your house be swallowed by a settlement. So uh, having said this, I want to ask you about the ongoing ne negotiations. You said yesterday and you repeated today that basically there is no document, there is no proposal, there is nothing in hand, nothing within. All it is is conversation. So are you telling us that the past seven months have been no more than some sort of a conversational therapy? And how this has really, uh, it, how is it different from the time that you negotiated with Mr. Miller 20 years ago? Thank you. Number one, when I say that we don't have an official document yet, I mean, setting a fact that the Americans have not submitted to us any official document. To submit an official document, we need more discussion. Now, when we have discussion, I'm not saying that these discussions are uh, meaningless. I mean, if, you reach, if you're going to reach a, a document, you're going to have to do discussion. You're going to have to talk. And that's what we're talking. We're talking very seriously, very in-depth. And as I told you, Saeed, no one, no one, maybe you don't want to believe me, but I, 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 I believe this as a Palestinian negotiator, no one benefits more from America's success, Kerry's success, than Palestinians, than you and I, and no one loses more if they fail more than us. That's the truth. So we hope and we're doing everything, Abu Mazen is doing everything humanly possible to ensure in our conversations that they uh, uh, succeed. And we, that's the subject of the settlements was on the table yesterday. We put a map to President Obama, showed him the extent of what happened since since we began in, uh, in uh, July. It's a very ugly map. It's a very ugly map. This was supposed to be, this is the land of the Palestinian state. And to hear that the, the, the Israeli government introduced uh, settlements in the pace of four times the natural growth of New York City in seven months, that's something is putting me in a very difficult situation convincing the Palestinians that it's doable. And we need to keep the hope alive in the minds of Palestinians. That's the most important element uh, we're doing. And I hope that we can continue working so we can achieve our joint endeavor by the end of April, and I hope before that even. But now I think we're going to have to talk about another date, which is March 29th. March 29th is the date where Israel is obliged to release the fourth tranche of Palestinian prisoners. We paid for this. I personally made the deal with Mr. Kerry in July 19th. We committed not to go to the UN agencies, protocols, conventions for nine months. In exchange, Mr. Netanyahu agreed to give us 104 prisoners pre Oslo and four tranches. I hope that Mr. Netanyahu will honor this, because what I'm hearing from the Israeli ministers doesn't, it's not encouraging. And the question to any Palestinian will be, if Mr. Netanyahu cannot deliver on an agreement that was paid with a strategic currency, prisoners, do you expect us to believe you saw Arikad that he will deliver on Jerusalem, borders, settlements, refugees, and so on? So it's very, very crucial that the Israeli government honors its commitment by releasing the fourth tranche of prisoners, which is separate from the negotiation. The price? We agreed not to go to the UN agencies, protocols, and conventions for nine months. And when I came under attack from my colleagues about this deal, I believe it's worth it. Giving peace a chance is worth it. It's worth it. And people in politics have the choice. They can take the comfortable position or the right position. I know those who take the comfortable position may not be criticized, may sleep well, may be whatever, but I don't think they will make a difference in the improvement of their societies. I hope that March 29th will be a date of honor, honoring an obligation by the, the Israelis. Yes, uh, third row here. Hi, Chris Bauman with National Defense University in the Pentagon. Um, I believe in the past you've said that you felt like American negotiators cooked up a deal with Israelis and then brought it to you, present company excluded, of course. 
Uh, do you feel like that has changed now, or do you feel like that's still somewhat the case? Well, I, I, I feel a difference this time. I really do. I think President Obama is uh, someone who's genuinely uh, trying to achieve a historic uh, change in the course of Middle East history, not in Palestinians and Israelis. And he does realize, I'm analyzing here, I'm not saying what he said, that it begins with a solution to the Arab uh, or Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, they know. They know that we don't have a neon saying stupid here. I mean, we know, you know, if someone like what these people used to do, go and speak with the Israelis and come to us. We did that. And you tell me, I tell you, this, this is, I've heard this from Israeli negotiators, verbatim. No, 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 these are our ideas. So I created the term, do I have a neon saying stupid, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> and, and today, today, the difference is there. But I hope that once the end product will be put on the table, it would reflect American ideas. Because that's the key to success. What's needed? What's required? What's fair? And I told Mr. Kerry one line. I told him, look, in relationships between humans, husbands and wives, fathers and sons, granddaughters. And if we miss the term F-A-I-R, fair, nothing will be sustained. No relation can be sustained without the instrument of fairness being there. So what we need from the American, what we need from this president, what we need from this secretary who's done more than anyone else, I mean, since March 6, 2013 till March 17th, yesterday, 2014, this man held 46 meetings with President Mahmoud Abbas, about 27 meetings with me and his teams, I think more than 100 meetings. Relentless, unwavering commitment, and I heard President Obama yesterday telling us that he has the full, this is secretary has his full backing. We want them to succeed. And success means fairness and what's needed. And let's hope for that. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Wait for the mic. Da Thank Dan, you. Dan is raising his hand. Mm -hmm. Dan Shifton has been raising his okay. hand for a long time. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Sapir. I'm a student at Georgetown University. Um, you mentioned earlier that Kerry genuinely believes that peaceful relations uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians will lead to changes in the Middle East. And my question to you is, do you also believe that? And if so, would cold, peaceful, relation, cold, peaceful relations as Israel has with um, Egypt and Jordan ultimately also lead to changes in the Middle East? Or would people not take that as seriously? I, I'll answer this question from three dimensions. Number one. Any description, description to the Israeli-Egyptian or Israeli-Jordanian peace treaties could be whatever people want to say. But look, look what Egypt went through in the past three years. The treaty with Israel stood. Whatever happened in the Middle East, Jordan, peace, treaty with Israel also was sustained, stood. There were changes of not figures in Egypt. There were changes of ideologies in Egypt. There were changes of thinking in Egypt. There was a Muslim Brotherhood president who accepted the credentials of an Israeli ambassador. Okay? So, the second dimension is that for Israel to understand that bilateralism works, unilateralism fail. Because they keep telling me, oh, we did the draw from Gaza and we draw from Lebanon and things did not work. No, of course did not work. With Egypt and Jordan, you did a bilateral agreement, so it stood the test of time. And with uh, Gaza and Lebanon, you did unilaterals, and we went down with you. It's failure. All right? And uh, number three, I, I, I believe that uh, a fair uh, peace agreement between Palestinians and Israelis will change the course of the culture of the Middle East because as Jen said in the beginning, there is a document called the Arab Peace Initiative 
which in my opinion is the most advanced strategic document Arabs came with since 1948. And it's very simple. Israel withdraws to the 1967 borders. Arab nations will have full normal relations with Israel. And by the way, this document was authored by a Saudi king. And that's the most important element on this. And it has the full backing of Arabs and Muslim countries. We have time, I think, for one additional question. Uh, Dan Shuftan. Thank you. Um, I think the elephant in the room has not been mentioned here, namely the right of return, because when you speak about rejecting the idea about a Jewish state, both Palestinians and the Arab League have tied it with the position that every Palestinian in the world, millions of descendants of uh, refugees, can come back into the state of Israel. And one of the reasons that it's being rejected is that you don't want to give up this right of return. From an Israeli perspective, this is what makes it so important. And I'm curious to see what you would respond to this Israeli concern. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, I think that the refugee issue is a core issue in the permanent status. And we have an agreement with Israelis all the time. Nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And Dan, I have not developed the technique yet to force the Israelis to sign on anything that, is, that doesn't serve their interests. So, you know, issue, I, I did not speak about Jerusalem today, if you noticed. I did not speak about security. I did not speak about borders or modifications. I did not speak any of the core issues because I'm under oath to John Kerry not to say a word about what goes on in these closed doors. And I don't want him to get angry at me because when he gets angry, he really gets angry. And I, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But, you know, uh, the, the issue of refugees is a subject is being negotiated on the table. So what's the relevance between me defining your nature outside while you're talking about the issue of refugees inside. And I know that we cannot sign an agreement without Israel agreeing on, and Palestinians for that matter, they will, they will sign when they feel that they can sign on all core issues. Believe me, there are issues that Israel will not even look at the document without. I mean, I'll tell you something. If I were an Israeli negotiator, I would target two points, end of conflict, end of claims, period. And Palestinians have their own, but this, the, the, at the end of the day, then, no, you're wrong. The, the negotiations, the, the refugees, is at the heart of the core issues of negotiations. It's there in the, in the negotiations. It's on the table. And I'm not, I'm not expecting Israel to sign anything they don't agree. I'm not saying that we agreed on this. I'm saying there are differences. But this is an issue for negotiations, not an issue for public diplomacy or putting me in the corner or blaming me or anything. And I don't want to be part of your defining your nature. I don't want to do that. I have an overloaded wagon of complexities trying to define my own mistakes and transformations, difficulties I'm going through to, inter to walk my nose into your affairs. I'm not going to do that. Well, I think we've reached the end of, uh, end of our, our time. I want to, Saab, first of all, let me thank you uh, for coming to the center again. I hope perhaps the next time you come, um, well, You'll, you'll get an invitation to come, and I know you'll come back. I'll and come you'll back. be as, as candid and as forthright as you've been here today. And I want to thank all of you for coming, and please uh, join me in thanking uh, Sabo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, Sab, best. Uh, Best to the best to the president when you see him, please. What? For me, best to the president. I will. I will. Please. Sure. Magic. Really. It's accessible. You get a meeting. I want to know what's going on.